Welcome to the Rock Church and World Outreach Center. We pray that this message will strengthen and encourage you. Now here's a message from Pastor Luke Cobray. Hey, listen, I'm going to get down on my knees. I'm going to go before the Lord in prayer because it's time for us to get into the Word of the Lord. Listen, I know I need prayer, but I know you need prayer. So I'm going to go on on my knees and I'm going to go before the Lord in prayer. And as I do, if you're able to stand, would you join me? And let's join together in our hearts as we go before the Lord and prepare to hear the Word of the Lord. Father, we come before you. Lord, we're just so grateful for the opportunity that we are here to come to hear from you, Lord. We don't come to this place to hear from a man or to hear from a woman. God, we don't come to hear from the old or the young or the black, the white, the brown or or anything like that. God, we don't come to church for entertainment or for tradition, but truly we come into this place to hear from you. We fully acknowledge that Jesus Christ is the senior leader of this house, and we ask in the name of Jesus that your Holy Spirit would speak to us, would minister to us, would show us the word of God today, that it would drop a seed into our hearts, Lord, that you would drop a seed into our hearts, Father, that you would, uh, we would cultivate the word of God, Lord, and bear much fruit for the glory of God. And Lord, we thank you for all the blessings that you've given to us, your church, Lord. We know at no time ever think of ourselves as better than anybody else, but rather we really are uh, co-laborers in the body of Christ, working together, many members of your body, all serving different purposes to build your kingdom for your glory. So Father, we thank you for all of our our, our brothers and sisters around the world, Lord. We thank you for our Catholic brothers and sisters and our denominational brothers and sisters, Baptist, Lutheran, Presbyterian, Episcopalian, Foursquare denominational brothers and sisters. Father, we thank you for our local churches in the area, for Harvest, for the Grove, for Sandals. Lord, we thank you for for, uh, 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 Emmanuel Baptist. Lord, we thank you for the Well and the Way, Ecclesiastes. God, we lift you up in this place today. And Lord, to you be the praise, the glory, and the honor. Lord, we thank you for it. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. amen. Praise God. Hallelujah. As you're taking your seats, go ahead, grab your Bibles. We're going to go to the book of Hebrews in the ninth chapter. Hebrews in the ninth chapter as we resume our study. Line upon line, precept upon precept. And I'm, I'm real excited for what God's got in store. I really believe that when we can grab a hold of what we're going to talk about today, and when we apply this to our life, what it does is it serves to change our perspective. It serves to widen our view of what we are and who we are in Christ and what God has done for us. Like Pastor Dan talked about last week, if you were here, uh, some of the things that we can talk about is, you know, we can, we can understand that Christ died for our sin. But if we don't go beyond that, if we don't look at the greater picture, we might miss out on some of the blessings and some of the callings and some of the inheritance that God has for us. And so what we are doing is by going in the book of Hebrews, line upon line, precept upon precept, we're digging into the Word of God, taking our time and just getting all that we can out of, out of the wonderful Word of God. And I'm excited for what God's got in store. So Hebrews in the ninth chapter, if you've got your Bibles, grab them, go with me to Hebrews in the ninth chapter. If you don't have your Bibles, make sure you bring your Bibles, man. Don't just take what I have to say as truth, but test it for yourself. Look at the Word of God and see if it's not the truth because never, never, never just take what a man says and apply that to your life, but rather you believe it for yourself. Read the Word of God for yourself. If you can't bring your Bible to church, where are you going to bring it out? So Hebrews in the ninth chapter, verse number 15, starts off by saying, and for this reason, Jesus Christ dying, giving of himself for us, how much more would the blood of Christ cover our conscience and cleanse us of, of dead works? Now for this reason, he is the mediator. The mediator. Now, I just want to talk and stop for just a, uh, for a moment and talk about this. The Bible describes Jesus Christ as our mediator. Now, in the book of Hebrews, we've been talking about Jesus Christ. And in the, in the book of Hebrews, paints a picture of Jesus being our high priest. Now, oftentimes for you and I, we can learn about the subject of being the high priest. We can understand what it means. But what we struggle with is we struggle to relate that to our day and age. We struggle to relate that directly to our lives because we don't live in an age where we have a high priest. We don't live in an age where we have sacrifice. So, yes, we can be taught the precepts and the message behind that, but it's hard for us to relate sometimes. And today I love how the fact that the Bible tells us that Jesus is our mediator. He is the mediator of the new covenant. Now, I want to try to paint uh, this picture in something that you and I might understand in in more detail and more depth and more uh, relative to our day and age. And we'll we'll, we'll continue on that. But the Bible tells us he's our mediator. Now, what is a mediator? A mediator is somebody that stands in the gap or stands in the middle of two parties. I I had some family members that were going through some legal proceedings and they have mediation. They they have a person where it's a neutral person. They, They don't side with one or the other, but rather they come and they they sit down with the two parties and they say, listen, you want this, you want this. Let's try to work out an agreement. Let's try to come to an agreement so that we can all live and and be civilized in this world. And so a mediator is somebody that comes, that stands in the middle, that, that, that represents a party to another. You see, God and humanity are separated. 
You've got to understand that from the very beginning, from the fall of mankind, humanity has been separated from God in the nature of sin. We have been born into it. We may not realize it. We may not admit it. We may not uh, call it a characteristic of our lives. But ingrained in us, in, hum in humanity, is the sin nature. And the Bible tells us that God is a just God. The Bible says that God is so righteous that he cannot even look upon sin. So here we see God is separated from mankind because God and sin do not dwell together. Where light exists, darkness cannot. So we have a mediator in Jesus Christ, a middle person, somebody that stands in the gap that represents us to God and God to us. This is a beautiful picture that we have been painted with Christ Jesus. The Bible goes on to tell us that Jesus Christ is our intercessor. That he intercedes on our behalf. Now, if you don't use that word or if you haven't used that word uh, very often, let me say it like this. If you've ever prayed for somebody on their behalf to God, maybe you know somebody that was sick and you were praying that God would heal them. Or maybe you were praying that God would speak to somebody or move on the life of somebody. You are interceding on their behalf. You are praying for them. Jesus Christ, the Bible describes as our intercessor. He is there interceding on our behalf, believing for us, praying for us, delivering uh, the, our needs to God on our behalf. So Jesus is our mediator. He is our middle ground. He is the one that stands in the gap. He is the one that intercedes or believes on our behalf. The Bible tells us in the book of John, 1 John that he is our advocate. He is our advocate. An advocate is somebody that represents. Have you ever seen, while watching television, you ever seen the, the commercial for the animal rights or for the, the humane society or for, for, you know, save the dogs or save the kittens or the whales or whatever it might be? You know what I'm talking about? Those commercials where you see the picture of an animal and it looks like it's suffering or maybe it's a dog and it's, it's, it's skinny and it's standing behind the cage of a, 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 of a kennel or something like that and it's shaking and you just, it just tugs on your heart. And then, and then, then it cuts to a celebrity. You know what I'm talking about? And that celebrity, they, they speak in a real quiet, somber, and they're looking at the camera as to, as to plead, please, your 50 cents a day will, will help this poor dog. <laughs> and you think, oh my goodness, how could I not, this poor, this poor innocent animal? You see, they're an advocate on the behalf. They are speaking on the behalf of that animal or that cause to entice you to come in to be a part of it. So Jesus Christ is our middle ground or our middle representative. Jesus Christ is our intercessor in the sense that he is believing in God for us. And now the Bible says that Jesus Christ is our advocate. He is representing you and I to God. Now that is where I want to kind of focus on today. Now we're going to go through Hebrews. We're going to look through some scriptures because I want to show you how a verse later on in the ninth chapter really brings back and ties back into what we've just talked about. So let's, let's go back into Hebrews where it says, He is the mediator of the new covenant by means of death and the redemption of the transgressions under the, the first covenant for those who are called may receive the promise of eternal inheritance. For where there is testament, verse number 16, there must also of necessity be the death of the, death of the testator. Verse number 17 comes along and says, For a testament is enforced after men are dead, since it has no power at all while the testator lives. We talked about that in the will. Once a, once a person dies, the will goes into effect. Verse number 18 comes on and says, Therefore, not even the first covenant was dedicated without blood. Do you recall a couple of weeks ago, we talked about the significance of the sacrifice. Blood is not something we relate to. It's something that we stray away from. In our society, we just we don't talk much about that, but you see the Bible is unashamedly and undoubtedly a bloody book. We talked about the significance in that innocent life being shed for our transgressions brings to you and I the weight of our sin. So it wasn't even the first covenant, wasn't even sealed without the shedding of blood. It was always in place. Verse number 19. When Moses spoke in every precept to the people according to the law, he took the blood of calves and goats with water, scarlet wool, and hyssop, and sprinkled both the book itself and the people, covering the book and the people, saying, You are now bound together. Verse number 20 comes along and says, This is the blood of the covenant which God has commanded you. Verse 21. Then likewise, he sprinkled with blood both the tabernacle and all the vessels of the ministry. Verse number 22 says to us, And according to the law, almost all things are purified with blood. And without the shedding of blood, there is no remission or separation or withdrawal. Remission is though, as though you take that and remove it from your presence. 
Without the shedding of blood, there is no removal of sin. With that being said, verse number 23 says, Therefore, because of all of that, without the shedding of blood, the importance of blood, therefore it was necessary. It was necessary. It was needed that the copies of the things in heavens should be purified with these. But in the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these. If you recall in Hebrews the 8th chapter, the Bible tells us that God divinely instructed Moses to build the tabernacle. It was a copy. It was an object lesson for mankind to understand the, the heavenly places and the presence of God. It was a temporary place. Now we know that Christ and, and God dwell in a place that is not made by, by human hands, but rather in the heavenly places. So the, the tabernacle and the temple and the altar and the sacrifice, these were copies or object lessons for us to understand what God was talking to us about. Now verse number 24 says... For Christ had not entered the holy places made with hands. Not the, not the object lesson. He went to the true source, which are copies of the true, but into heaven itself. He went to heaven itself. Now, I love this. This is awesome. If this doesn't just make you want to jump and dance and, sound, and run in circles, we don't serve a dead God. We don't serve a God who is dead. You see, Jesus Christ was nailed to the cross. Hallelujah. Amen. And three days after he was nailed to the cross, guess what? He rose from the dead. We serve a living God, Jesus Christ, in the heavenly places. But that's not even what I want to talk about today. I want to talk about the last two words in verse number 24. Into heaven itself now to appear in the presence of God for us. We have a live and living God, Jesus Christ. And not only is he in the heavenly places, he is in the heavenly places in the presence of God for us. Now the title of this morning's message is a council, the council that we can count on. Now, I remember every year, without fail, same timing. Some people say, I never get these, but I, every year I get this letter. It's beige. It's got a brown stripe across the envelope. It's got, a, it's got a seal of the county of San Bernardino. And it tells me that I am, to do, I am due to appear for my civic duty. It is my jury duty summons. Some people, it drives me nuts. People, Man, I don't ever get called for jury duty. It's like, dude, every year I get called on the same month at the same time. It's just like it's just in my calendar. I know it's coming. And when we sit there, I remember I was sitting in the jury duty uh, selection process, and there was the judge, and there was the defense and the prosecuting attorney, and they were interviewing the, the potential jurors for the trial that was about to commence. And I remember as I was sitting there, the judge referred to the attorneys as counselors. They are counselors. They are counsel. The defense and the prosecution. And Jesus Christ is like yours and mine. He is our counsel. He is our attorney. He is our representative. You see, going back to verse 15, he is our mediator. He is our, uh, our middle ground. He is the one that stands in the gap or in the place of man and God because we are disconnected through the sin nature. He is our intercessor believing on our behalf, believing that we are, are worthy of this. He is our advocate representing us when we could not be there in heavenly places. Places. So Jesus Christ, our great counsel, is there, it says, in heavenly places, in the presence of God for us. I love this. If you ever watch those, those crime shows or, or movies where it involves uh, 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 judges and, and, and attorneys, I love it. There's always a scene where one of the attorneys is, is kind of getting a little out of line or, or is putting something or he's throwing evidence that nobody knew about and the judge slams his gavel down and says, counselors in my chambers. Now, you know, they all go back. You've seen the, it's the, the judge's private chambers back behind the courtroom and they all go in there and they discuss in private. You see, Jesus Christ is in the private chambers of God, in the holy places where you and I cannot go. It is off limits to us, but he is in the presence of God for us, as the Bible says, advocating, mediating, interceding on our behalf. And now we can see that we have Jesus Christ, our great high priest, our great representative, advocating on our behalf. And when we realize that, it begins to open up a perspective in life that we may not have ever really realized in the past. And it begins to bring a whole new avenue of understanding in our lives. So today, today I want to talk about some things out of the Word of God. I've got to get my notes ready. I didn't even have them ready. I was all going off memory right there. All right, praise God. Today I'm going to make a statement. 
What does it, the question is I want to ask before I make the statement is why is Christ in the presence of God so important for you and I? And what do we take away with that? Praise God we have a God that's not dead. Praise God Jesus Christ, as he says in the book of Luke, is seated at the right hand of the Father. In the book of Romans, is seated at the right hand of the Father, making intercession for us. He is our great high priest, as we saw in Hebrews, or as we see in Hebrews, that pass through the heavens. What does that mean for you and I? He is our great representation, our advocate, our mediator. Today, I'm going to say this statement and I'm going to complete it with three simple words. Three easy words that when we can grab a hold of these words, it will change our perspective, open up our viewpoint of life, that when we walk out of this building, we can realize who we are in God and who God is in us. Today, Jesus in the presence of God brings us. That's the statement. I'll complete it with three simple words today. Jesus in the presence of God brings us, number one, identification. Jesus in the presence of God, our great advocate, our great high priest, our great mediator brings us identification. Not only now can we identify with God, but also we have a God that can identify with us. Let me, paint, let me, let me take you somewhere. Let me, let me go deep on you for a minute, okay? God is just. We can't argue that. There's no argument about that. God is, there's nothing in the world, nothing in the universe that compares to the righteousness of God. God is so just as we talked about that he cannot even look upon sin. So here we see that we have a just God. But then we have humanity that through the fall of man is unjust. We have a sin nature. So God has two roles in our lives. He is a just God, but he is also God, our justifier. But the problem is, is that God is so just that if he was to just, if he was to look at our indecency or our sin nature, we are separated. He cannot be connected to that. The Bible tells us that where light exists, darkness can't. God is the source of light. Therefore, darkness, sin cannot exist in the presence of God. So we are separated from God. So the problem is, is that God, our justifier, could come and look upon us and just say, okay, I'll blot your sins away. I'll forget them. I'll overlook them. But if God decides to overlook them or to turn his head away from our sinner to oversee that without a price being paid, then God is no longer just because he's sweeping sin under the carpet. So how can God, who is just, also be our justifier? That's why he painted or he put in place the old covenant that blood had to show us, life had to be shed so that we could understand the weight of our sins. So now our just God, who has become our justifier, comes and takes the only solution that, that can exist in our humanity, and that is for God himself to become man, to pay the price that is due to us so that we could be justified or just as if we had never sinned with God. So God, who is just, becomes our justifier. Through the form of Jesus Christ. The Bible tells us that Adam is the, that, that, that Adam, in Adam, all men died or sinned. And because of Adam, all men face this consequence. But Jesus Christ comes and he takes the last position, the final position of man, the last Adam, the Bible tells us, where he removes the, the oppression of sin and death from mankind and he frees us and he redeems us. Jesus Christ now came and dwelt amongst us, lived amongst us as mankind, not just a God. See, when we understand that, when we see that, now we realize that it's not God who sits there on the heavenly places and looks down upon us and says, how dumb can they be with his two by four ready to smack us over the head? Because now the Bible tells us, if you look in Hebrews, the fourth chapter, Hebrews in the fourth chapter, it says, we have a great high priest, our advocate, our mediator, our intercessor, who has passed through the heavens. Jesus, the son of God, holding on. So let us hold on to our confession. Look what it says. Verse 15. For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but was in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. So we have a God who can now identify with us, not just on this separate level of God and in his righteousness and man in their lowly state, but now God chose willingly to come in the form of man through Jesus Christ to identify with us, to experience life with us so that now he can say, I know what you're going through. Now, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to ask you a question. Where's, where, my men, where are you at in the house? Let me, let me get a manly Tim Allen kind of grunt. Where are my men at? Show me. Come on. Come on, man. Let me see where you at. All right. All right. A lot of burping going on right there. All right. Now, ladies. Where are the ladies in the house? Oh, look at you. Right on. Now, see, there is a certain level or a certain plane in which men and women will never relate. That is the area of childbirth. For the men, hallelujah. <laughs> Praise God. 
See, my wife and I, we have two kids. Our first born, our first born Bjorn, it, it was pleasant. It, I mean, pleasant is, 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 see, again, I can't relate. But it was, it was, so, it was so smooth. My wife, she was going through the, the, through, the, through the labor pain, so we went to the hospital, and they gave her the medication, and it was just a long process. It wasn't too long. It wasn't too short. And she had time. I got a picture of her. She's sitting in the delivery bed, and she's putting on her makeup as the baby's starting to come. I mean, it's just, you know, and, and, and the doctors come. It wasn't too long of a pushing process. It wasn't too short. It was just, just perfect, just, just easy. <laughs> then our second, Emma, she came. And it was like you see in the movies, those, those comedic love stories where somebody's having a baby. Stacy all of a sudden like wakes up, like, it's time. So, you know, I'm panicking, running around the house. They're getting in the car, we're going. It's like 2 o'clock in the morning. You know, there's not a soul on the road. And if you've ever seen it like this, it's maybe in the movies or something. We're stopped at the red light, and I can look at the street. It's just red light, red light, red light, red light, red light. And there's my beautiful wife sitting on the front row of the car, and, and she's just grabbing onto everything she can. Just <laughs> and she's just, she's throwing up into anything that will contain liquid. We had like a popcorn bag from the movies and, and, and everything, that, anything that she's just going all over the place. And so finally she looks to me and she's got that like look of rage in her eyes. You know what I'm talking about? You've seen it in the movies and she's like, run the lights! Okay! So we're going through the hospital. We're going to the hospital. We're breaking every speed law and every, every stop and traffic violation. We get to the hospital. It's right in the middle of a shift change for the nurses. So she comes in there. They wheel her in with the wheelchair and all that stuff. I mean, she's huffing and puffing. They put her in the exam room, and the nurses come. Oh, it's okay. No worries. No problem. We'll be right there. They walk away, and they're just kind of jabbing around. Not that they, not that they just jab her, but they were just kind of, they were talking about their, you know, they were doing their, uh, their run-throughs. And so she's like, she's sitting over there, and she's huffing and puffing. Ugh, this baby's coming. Get a nurse. Okay, baby. So I go get the nurse. Excuse me, nurses. Uh, my wife is uh, having a baby over there. Uh, do you want to come maybe look at her? Yeah, yeah, yeah. We, we, we go through this all the time. She'll be just fine. I'll come back. Babe, the nurses say they're coming. Go get the nurse. Okay. So I come back. Can you please just come with me? Please just come with me. So finally the nurses come. Doctor comes in right at the right time. All right, and I mean, it happens fast. And there, there she is on the birth in the delivery bed, and she's huffing and puffing. She's pushing. The midwife's there, and the, she's looking at me. She's going, Dad, are you okay? Dad, are you okay? I can see your eyes starting to roll in the back of your head. You, Dad, if you faint, I'm not coming after you, okay? You know, I'm sitting there, and all I can do as a man, all I can do is I can just kind of hold her hand and pat her on the, on, on the shoulder. It's okay. It's okay, baby. It's okay. And she looks up at me. She says, Don't touch me. <laughs> Okay. All right. See, I will never be able to relate to my wife. I can go through pain. I can cut myself or, or break a bone or anything like that. But I will never be able to relate to the type of pain that she endured. But you see, we have a God in heaven, Christ, who is in the heavenly places, in the presence of God, that doesn't just look at us and say, hey, it's okay. Even though I'm God and you're man, I don't know what you're talking about. I'm, I'm, on, a, I'm on a level higher, higher than you are. No, we have Jesus Christ that says, hey, I've experienced pain like you can't imagine. Hey, I know what it feels like to have somebody break my heart. I know what it feels like to have people walk away from me. And when we feel like we're most alone, now when we hear the statement, you're not alone, we realize that there is a God in heaven, Jesus Christ, that is saying, I have experienced what you are experienced, and I can now identify with you. So that when we stumble and fall in our lives, we don't have a God that says, you idiot. We have a God that says, hey, listen. I've experienced temptation. And though I made it through it, I know how hard it is. And I have given the grace to go through it. We have a God who can identify with us. Secondly, today, we're talking about Jesus and the presence of God brings us. Number two for today, substitution. Substitution. You see, without even realizing it, without even understanding it, we had a bounty on our heads. We had blood on our hands. You say, Pastor Luke, I never felt like I was a bad person. I never felt like I committed any crimes or anything like that. But you see, we are, the term is guilty by association. We were there at the crime scene, the crime scene of the birth of humanity. We are born into it. Therefore, we are guilty. The verdict has already been placed. Now the warrant has been issued. And the accuser of the brethren, the devil, is out to seek and to condemn you and I. 
And we have been given substitution. Substitution in that Jesus Christ came and paid the price for us. With a bounty that we could not afford to make God who loved his creation so much that he came and dwelt among us, came and took the burden of sin and death upon his shoulders and carried it for us. Remember we talked about that scapegoat in, in Hebrews or, or, or the, the, without the shedding of blood there is no remission. Remember that? We talked about that. It's like the Hebrews, they would lay their hands on the goat and they would walk it out of the, of the village or out of the city and they would leave it in the wilderness and that was a signify. They, they, were, they were passing their sins onto this innocent animal and it was out to, to fend for itself in the wilderness. But you see, there was always the implication, there was always the thought in the back of the mind that that goat might find its way back into the city limits. And could you imagine what the implications would be if they saw their sins walking back through the streets to return on them? But you see, the Bible tells us that Jesus Christ came and died once and for all, and he took our sins and separated them, carried them away from us. Remission, remember that, drew them away from us as far as the east from the west so that you and I would not have to live with this understanding that our sins might come back, but we have been separated from them. In 1 Peter, the third chapter, 1 Peter, the third chapter, I'll put it up on the overhead for you. 1 Peter, chapter number 3, verse number 18. It says, for Christ... Also suffered once for sins, the just for the unjust, the guilty, those who had blood on their hands, who had a bounty on their heads, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive for the Spirit. Jesus Christ came and paid the price. I remember when I was at jury duty and I was sitting in the courtroom, I remember as the, the judge was there, I, I have this picture in my head of, of a courtroom, and here we are, humanity. Standing there at the, at the base of this bench, high and mighty in this position of authority. And there is the judge or, or the righteous one standing at the bench. And there's the accuser of the brethren, the devil, there standing. And he's made his case against us and we are, are guilty. The judge comes and he slams the gavel down as he reads the verdict. Death by separation from God. And as the bailiffs come and they grab us by, by each arm as we're held in chains by hand and foot and they come to take us away to carry out our sentence, all of a sudden the judge from his high position says, from his, from his, from his high bench says, stop. He stands up from his seat, walks around the corner of the bench down the steps to the floor of the courtroom. And he walks over to the, to the bailiffs who are ushering us out as they look at us, as they look at the judge in, in surprise, what are you, what are you doing? And he puts his hands out to the bailiffs and he says, release this man, release this woman. I will carry their sentence. The sentence, the verdict was for me so that they could live. You see, the Bible says that we are to die and face judgment. There will be a time when we sit at the throne of God, the great judgment of God, and God will be there in his position of justice, looking down at us, the accuser of the brethren, the prosecuting attorney, the devil, will have a rap sheet of every iniquity, of every sin that we have committed in our lives, as well as those that we were born into. So much so that it would take an eternity to go over everything that we have committed. And there they will read off every sin. There they will read off everything that we go through. And the verdict will clearly be death by separation from God. But then just in a moment, Jesus Christ, who is seated at the right hand of God, stands from his position, or sits, or stands from his position next to God, and he stands up and he reveals the scars that are on his hands, and he holds them in the air, and he cries out, Stop! The courtroom goes silent. And Jesus Christ says, the price has been paid. He pulls out his defense on our behalf, his advocacy, his mediation. It's a folder. It's a book. We call it the Lamb's Book of Life. He opens it up. Our name is there. In an instant, the wrapped sheet of our sin disappears. The devil's argument is gone, and our price has been paid. We have been given substitution for the blood on our hands. So that we can live. And because of that, why does it matter? It matters because we don't wait for heaven to, re to, to reach us. But we work each and every day so that we can bring as many people to heaven with us. Because we have been given substitution. And listen, like, like the song says, free, or like Martin Luther King Jr. says, free at last, right? Free at last. Thank God Almighty, I'm free at last. we got to tell somebody about it. It matters. It matters. We have been substituted by Jesus. There is no condemnation in our lives. We are living heaven-minded now. Because of our counsel, we can count on Jesus in the presence of God. Last one for today. You with me? Yeah. Jesus in the presence of God, number three today, brings us transformation. 
transformation. You think of it like this. The word we use in science nowadays is metamorphosis. From a worm to a moth, from a caterpillar to a butterfly. We were once mankind, a lowly worm that crawled in the dirt. But God has transformed us through the blood of Jesus Christ, through the power of Jesus Christ. Now he is there in the presence of God for us on our behalf. And because of that, you and I have transformation power in our lives. It is now the grace of God that propels us to become who God has called us to be and to no longer remain who we once were. Colossians in the first chapter, I'll put it on the overhead for you. And you who were once alienated and enemies... Enemies, enemies. Think of the, the weight that word has. We were alienated and enemies of God in our minds by wicked works in our thoughts and in our lives. Yet now he has reconciled, brought together, brought back in, restored. Look what verse number 22 says. In the body of his flesh through death to present you holy. How do we go from being enemies to being holy, blameless, and we're above reproach because we have been transformed. We have been literally changed from the lowly worm that crawls in the dirt to the lofty places and spiritual blessings because of the transformation power of Jesus Christ. We have been changed daily. Hallelujah. The Bible says that we are, like we said, new creations. The old has gone away. Behold, all things become new, but I don't know about you. I don't know about you. I'll be open and honest. I'll be, I'll be the first one to raise my hand. There are times in my life when I feel like my body didn't get the memo. Hey, you're a new creation. Really? My body doesn't feel like that. You see, what, where do we go through life when our bodies, when our lives, when our flesh doesn't get the memo? That's the life that we live in. We say the Bible says, oh, we're new creations. We think all of a sudden that it's just going to be this transformation. Our skin, our, our blemishes, our, our, our imperfections are going to change. But yet we come to know Christ and yet we look at our hands and they're the same. We look at ourselves in the face. It hasn't changed. But yet we are born again, born over. See, Jesus told Nicodemus that what is born of the flesh is flesh. What is born of the spirit is spirit. And our spirit by God has been reborn, has been regenerated. We are a new creation in the spirit. And now it is up to our spirit to let our body know about the memo. Look what it says in Romans, the 12th chapter. Romans, the 12th chapter. We'll finish with this. Romans, the 12th chapter, verse number one. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies. The, 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 the one that didn't get included in the memo, remember that? Your bodies, a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. How is that possible when I don't feel sometimes like my body has been redeemed? Verse number two, praise God. Do not be conformed. Don't blend in. Don't continue in doing the same things that you did yesterday, but rather be what? Transformed. How is that transformation come? By the renewing of your mind that you may prove, prove with evidence what is good, acceptable, and perfect will of God. You know, the last I checked, my body or my mind will survive without my arms. But my arms would never survive without being connected to my mind. So the question then is if the Bible tells us to present our bodies as living sacrifices, pure, holy, blameless, to prove what is good, acceptable, and perfect to God, how do we do that? The question is a matter of control. Who or what is in control? Is it your body or your mind? Well, it is your mind that controls your body. And what is it that feeds your mind? Well, it's either the world, conformity, or your spirit, transformation. And listen, I got two dogs at home, Sophie and Bella. Sophie we call my wife's dog. Bella we call my dog. Now, I am a believer that my dogs only need to eat, as the dog food bag says, once a day. So I feed my dogs healthily. My wife, on the other hand, she looks at my dogs and she says, oh, they look so hungry. So we have two dogs. Sophie's the kind of dog that she just wants to be by your side. She just will not leave you. She won't. She, she, if you go to the bathroom, you've got to make sure that you get there before she doesn't close the door because she will come and sit under your legs. And it's like, this is a little bit intimate. I'm not comfortable with this. Bella, on the other hand, had the blessing of not being born with a brain. She's outside chasing after butterflies or something like that. I mean, she's just in another world. 
So we have these two dogs. One of them eats more than the other. So Bella is a healthy weight. Sophie, on the other hand, she's lost her, you know, feminine figure, so to speak, and, and she weighs about twice what she's supposed to weigh. She has to have be fed diet food. But you see, whichever dog you feed is going to get bigger. Why is Sophie bigger? Because she eats more. The question is, is what are we feeding? Are we feeding our bodies that we're supposed to present holy, blameless, without reproach? Are we feeding our bodies the conformity or the things of this world? Or are we feeding our bodies the transformation that we have had on the inside of us, our spirit? Because when we begin to feed our bodies or our minds the things of the spirit, that's why the Bible says to be spiritually minded is life and peace. To be carnally minded is death. So when we begin to live our life by feeding our minds, which controls our bodies, the things of God, all of a sudden the transformation that takes place in the spiritual becomes a transformation of the physical. And now we can look back at our life and say, the chains of addiction, the chains of bondage, the sins that I once committed, the issues that I had, the, 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 the repro or reproaches I had of God are no longer a part of me. I have been separated. There has been remission because I have been given identification with God. I have been provided substitution. And now because of that, I have been transformed in my life. But it is a decision for you and I. So as we walk out of this place, remember Jesus Christ, our mediator, our, our advocate, our attorney in heaven, in the, in the chambers of God on our behalf, gives us identity. He can recognize the pain that we go through. He understands the trials and temptations that we endure through life. We have been given substitution. The price has been paid. Therefore, we should live life with heavenly-minded mentality, not this earthly mentality. And that brings us to a place of transformation when we begin to think on the things spiritual, not on the things carnal. And then so we find life and peace and we find transformation. We go from that lowly worm in the dirt to now this lofty butterfly beautiful in the air as nature provides for us. God gives us the picture. But you and I, have got to understand. And when we get that, it changes our entire perspective. Did you guys get something out of the word of the Lord today? <laughs> Praise God. Hey, listen, I want to do one more thing. I want to just ask you a quick question. Just give me a moment more of your attention. Just, uh, I want to ask you something very serious, very important. I want to ask you, and I want, I want all of your attention here because it's so important. I want to ask you this. If you were to leave today and you were to die, hypothetically speaking, would you go to heaven or would you go to hell? The answer is rather simple, but you see, nobody, nobody's going to know that answer except you and God. The follow-up question then is, what makes you think you're going to get to heaven? Did you know that nowhere in the Bible does it say that because you want to, because you think so, because you hope so, that you're going to get to heaven like you have the most positive outlook on life, the most, most positive thinking you're going to get there? I'm sorry, nowhere in the Bible does it say that. Did you know that nowhere in the Bible does it say that because you come to church, because you hear the pastor preach, because you carry your Bible, that you're going to get into heaven? You can't get to heaven because you come to church, because you're sitting in service and listen to a man talk. Nowhere in the Bible does it say that because you volunteer in the youth or the children's or the, or the choir or the usher's church or because you're involved in church, maybe you've even got a cross or St. Christopher around your neck or you've got a Jesus tattoo or a scripture reference somewhere on your body. Nowhere does it, in the Bible does it say that because you've done any of those things that you're going to get into heaven. You see, we think that we can get to heaven because we're good people, because we do good things. We don't cheat on our taxes or we don't drive too fast or rob the 7-Eleven or anything like that. We, we live good lives. But the reality is, is God says that our good deeds according to his righteousness are like filthy rags. You see, nothing you and I could ever do on our own would ever make us good enough to get into heaven. It's not about calling ourselves Christians or giving ourselves a title or our parents telling us when we were children or we were baptized or christened as a baby that because of that we're going to get into heaven. The only way you and I can get into God's heaven is God's way. And Jesus Christ is that way. Jesus says that he is the way, the truth, and the life. No one goes to the Father except through him. So let's not play any games with God. Let's not mess around or with our mental games, but rather let's do this God's way. The only way to God's heaven is God's way, and that's through Jesus Christ. And Jesus speaking to a man in John, the third chapter, a man by the name of Nicodemus, who was a religious man, who was a man who taught in the synagogue of the church of his time, who gave to the poor. You would think that as Jesus has this conversation about eternal life with Nicodemus, that he would pat him on the shoulder and just say, keep on going. But Jesus says to Nicodemus these words, you must be born again. Now, that's what I talked about today. What is born of the flesh is flesh. What is born of the spirit is spirit. You see, born again, regardless of what Hollywood or society tries to make it out to be in the eyes of God from the beginning of the Bible to the end of the Bible has always meant the same thing. Here it is. It means that you've given God all of your heart. It means that you've given God all of your life. 
It's not a mental ascent towards him. It's not about your carnal knowledge of who he is. It's not about your positive thinking or your positive outlook on life. Listen, I already know you know who Jesus is. That's why you're here today. But God's after all of your heart. God's after all of your life. The devil in hell and demons in hell know who God is, yet they're not going to find their way to heaven. Let me prove it to you. Take it one step further. In the book of Revelation, Jesus Christ is speaking to the church. The church, people like you and I. And he says, I'm going to come back, he says. And when he comes back, he better find us hot or he better find us cold, he says, because if he finds us lukewarm, he will vomit us from his mouth. That's a shocking statement. And what Jesus Christ is saying is that lukewarm Christians will be rejected and ejected from the kingdom of God, counted as waste from the kingdom. Well, what does lukewarm mean? Let's, let's define that simply put like this. A little bit in, a little bit out, a little bit up, a little bit down. Occasional church attendance, doing your own thing instead of God's thing. Simply put, you're not wholehearted in on it. Think about it like this. If you're in a marriage, if you're in a relationship, if you have friends, if you have a business partnership, if you have children, any relationship you experience in your life, if you were to come to that person and say, you know what, I'm only going to give you half of my effort, half of my love, half of my time. You know full well, as well as I do, that in our, law, in our human logic, we understand that that relationship would not succeed. Yet we think that we can come to God and say, I'll give you Sunday and a couple other days of my year or of my month and think that we're good enough with God. When God says, listen, I want all of you or none of you. It's an all or nothing relationship with God. So how do we do this today? I want to give you the opportunity. You see, God's not a manipulator. He's not a conniver. He's not going to force his way or make his way. You've got to accept. You've got to make the choice. The Bible says that the gift of God, the gift of God is eternal salvation. You and I have to choose to accept and receive it. God's not in the business of condemning or, or rejecting or sending people to hell. You see, the Bible says that God so loved the world, he gave Jesus to die a beaten, bloody mess on a cross, to die naked for the world to see so that you and I can accept him with all of our hearts, with all of our lives, and live our lives out of abundance like Jesus tells us. But the choice is ours. So how do we do this? And today, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to count to three in just a moment. I'm going to go one, two, and on the count of three, I'm going to go bang! Smack my hand on my Bible real loud, just like that. And when I smack my hand on my Bible, bang! Here's what I'm going to ask you to do. I want to ask you to be bold. I'm going to ask you to put your hand up. And what you're doing by the raising your hand, you're just saying, hold on, I'll see the hand. I'll get you just a minute. I got you. What you're doing is you're saying, I want to give him my heart. I want to give him my life today. You say, Pastor Luke, I don't know if I can do this. You see, Jesus Christ said, if you confess him before men, he'll confess you before his father. But if you deny him, he'll deny you. What you're doing is you're saying, Ann, I acknowledge I want to do this. I want to make sure today I'm a man. I'll see it. I'll acknowledge it. Put your hand right down. Hands are already going up. The decision is yours. You say, Pastor Luke, I can't do that. Listen, let me encourage you. Don't let a moment of embarrassment stop you. An irrational moment of embarrassment stop you from making the best decision you've ever made in your life. Listen, if you inherited a large sum of money and you bought a nice car and a fancy home, you would want the entire world to know about your decisions. But you see, this is the best decision as a human being you could ever make because it ensures your destiny with God, leaving the past behind, becoming transformed in the eyes of Jesus Christ and in the grace of God, becoming who God has called you to be, to live life in abundance. It's your choice today. Who should raise their hand? If you've never given them your heart, you've never given them your life, in just a moment, that's you, pop your hand up. Who should raise your hand? You're not sure? Don't walk away today without making sure this is your moment, this is your day. Who should raise your hand if you've been living lukewarm, doing your own thing instead of God's thing, running from God instead of to God? This is your moment. This is your time. In just a moment, when I smack my hands on my Bible and I count to three, that's you. Pop your hand up. I'll see it. I'll acknowledge it all over this place. You keep it so I can see it. Be bold about it. It doesn't matter what the person on your left or your right is saying. You know what the reality is? You're thinking, oh, no, they're going to judge me. What the reality is is they're rooting you on. This is your moment. This is your time. This is the day of your salvation. Hands are already going up. This is your choice. From the front of the auditorium to the back, whether you're in the Love Rock Cafe or you hear the sound of my voice watching online, wherever you're at, this is your moment. This is your time. Don't let this opportunity pass you by. Here we go. I'm going to count. Get ready. This is you. Here we go. One, two, three. See, I see that hand. One, two. I see you. Right there. Three. I see you. Where are your hands at? Let me see your hands. Come on. Today, where are you at? Raise them up. Four, five. I see you right there. Five wise people. Anybody else in this place today? I see those hands. Six. I see that. Where are you at? Pop your hands up today. Come on. Be bold. Don't let that embarrassment stop you. This is your moment. I got you. I got you right there. Seven. I got you right there. Eight. I got you guys. I got you, my man. Nine in the, in the foyer. I got you up here in the front. Nine wise people. Anybody else in this place today? Come on. If that's you, I got that guy in the family room. Nine wise people. Anybody else today? Anybody else in this place today? Where are you at? Number 10, you say, man, I wonder if I should. I wonder if I should. Listen, this is your moment. This is your time. The Bible says it's the goodness of God that draws men to repentance. Stop playing games with God. It's not about me. It's about you. Today in this place, nine wise people. Anybody else in this place? I'm going to close it up in just a moment. Where are you at? Where are you at? Come on. That's you in this place. God's tugging on your heart right now. Come on, that's you. Oh, I know you're in here. I feel you in here. Where are you at, number 10? Where are you at? I'm going to close it up. Anybody else? 
Ten. Praise God. Hallelujah for ten wise people. Awesome, awesome. Hey, listen. For those of you that raise your hand, what you just says, man, I want to do this. Now it's time to follow through with it. We're going to pray together. We're going to, uh, you're going to accept Jesus Christ into your heart and into your life. You're going to be transformed and born again. We want to help you with that. If it's important enough for you to raise your hand, it's important enough for you to follow through the right way. So here's what I'm going to ask. All of those of you that raised your hand from the front, the back, wherever you're at, wherever you're at, family rooms, the ushers will come and help you grab your stuff. I want you in just a moment to get your coat, your sweater, your purse, your Bible. A friend, if you brought your family, hey, bring them with you if you need to. Get out of your seat. Get out of your chair. Come meet me up in the aisle, up here in the aisle, and we're going to change destinies together. So let's all stand, please. Nobody leave as they come forward. If that's you, come on, get out of your seat. Get out of your chair. Come on, meet me up here. Let's change destinies today. Just as I am without one plea, but that thy blood was shed for me, and that thou biddest me. You can come, come on, if that's you. Congratulations. Hey, congratulations. All right, praise God, praise God. Congratulations. Come on, if that's you, come on. You raise your hand, come on. Congratulations. Awesome. Praise God. Hallelujah. Hey, listen, guys, today is a new day. You're not going to a funeral. You're going to a birthday celebration. Today is the first day of the rest of your life. Yes. Great job. Here's what I want to do. See this guy right over here waving at you? That's Pastor Joel. Pastor Joel's a really neat guy. Nothing weird goes on. Here's what he's going to do. He's going to take you right over there. Listen, nothing weird goes on. I'm as weird as it gets. You got it through me, okay? He's going to take you right over there. He's going to lead you in a prayer. You get saved by asking Jesus Christ to be your Lord and Savior, okay? So he's going to lead you in a prayer. He's going to give you some free literature, really easy reading, so that when you walk out of this place and you say, now what do I do? That free literature, it's like 20 pages, real easy, real third grade reading level, okay? Uh, and he's going to point you in the right direction, get you started in the right direction. Last thing he's going to do is he's going to give away a friend. We give away friends here. They're called spiritual personal trainers. You know, you go to the gym, you get a personal trainer, make sure you don't waste your time on that equipment you have no clue how to use. Well, we got somebody that will meet with you right before church, so buy with you, sit down with you, buy you a cup of coffee, teach you some things about the Word of God for five weeks, give you a really cool Bible at the end of that to help get you strong in the ways of God so that you don't go back to the life that you came from, but you meet your full potential in Jesus Christ. So if you guys just turn to your left, my right, right over here with Pastor Joel. Praise God. Hey, you just heard that altar call. You just wanted to give God all of your heart and all of your life. Now let me lead you simply in a prayer of inviting Jesus Christ into your heart as your Lord and Savior. In fact, why don't you just go ahead and listen to me and go ahead and close your eyes and just repeat these words after me. I'll go slow. You repeat them. Say these words. Say, Father God, I come to you in the name of Jesus. I believe that Jesus Christ is your only begotten Son, and that you sent him for me, and that he died for me on that cross at Calvary. I believe that his blood washes away my sins, that I am now a new creature in Christ Jesus. And I thank you, Lord. I receive you now and forever as my Lord and as my Savior. I'm going to turn from sin, and I'm going to turn with all of my heart and all of my life to you, Jesus, as my Lord and as my Savior. Let it be known in heaven as well as upon the earth that I am born again. I'm a child of God, that I'm saved, and I'm headed for heaven and denying my presence in hell. Thank you, Jesus. I'm alive forevermore. Love you so much. God bless you guys. Everybody just say amen and receive Christ as your Lord and Savior. So talk to you later. God bless you. Thank you for listening to the Rock Church and World Outreach Center. If this message spoke to you, please share it with us. We'd love to hear from you. You can find more information at www.rockchurch.com.